Greetings and uh, good morning, Dana. Thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you for having Richard and I here. Um, the Edelman Trust Barometer is something that we've done for the past 20 years because we fundamentally believe that everything is rooted in trust. And uh, what we've learned from the research we did in the beginning of the year, uh, uh, what we learned when we did research after COVID happened and what we've done now, which is our second piece of research on racial equity and injustice, is that there is an expectation for leaders to lead. As Richard and I talk more about this, you will see and determine for yourself whether that is actually happening or not. And um, I, I think the, the headline is that it's not, and, um, but we have the opportunity to change things. We're going to talk about this research, but there are four things that I hope that you will keep in mind, four sort of great takeaways from the research that's going to be presented. One is this is a movement and not a moment. A lot of our clients have said to us, so do I need to prepare for the long term? Is this just a blip? Is this something I have to do this summer? It is clear that this is a movement and this is not a moment. Um, while you will see that there is a dip of in interest, awareness, and expectation between the murder of George Floyd and the maiming of Jacob Blake, uh, which indicates that in many, among some communities, people need to see it to believe it. They need to see this, uh, these horrific instances in order for them to actually believe that the problem is real, but uh, it is a movement and not a moment. Uh, secondly, uh, for corporations, the expectation is high. The expectation that you do something is high, but uh, uh, corporations are being rated very low in terms of performance to date. Not that that can't change, but we're expecting you to do something and there's a sense that you are not, uh, uh, you're not responding, you're not listening, you're not paying attention, and you are not acting. Uh, thirdly, the media is a problem. Uh, the media is contributing to uh, the coverage uh, by stereotyping and what I would call some really significant racial profiling. And, and fourth, um, and I don't think this will be a surprise to anyone, uh, black people feel this acutely. This is a black and a white thing, uh, probably perhaps due to our very uh, challenging, uh, tough, uh, uh, dicey history in this country. Uh, communities across the board feel racial inequity. Communities of color really feel racial inequity. We black people feel it very deeply and very acutely. Uh, now let's talk about the research. On this, I'm looking for the first slide. Okay. Second slide. The most important thing here is timing. We went into the field um, in the first part of August, uh, and then Mr. Blake was maimed, was shot on the 23rd. So we went back into the field. This ended up being material because, again, uh, you saw some dips in between when we did the original research in June and when we did uh, the update research the 1st of July, 1st of August. But in August 28th, after the aftermath of Mr. Uh, Jacobs uh, shooting, you could significantly see that people cared about this and they paid closer attention. Next slide, please. In June, when we did the original research, we found that 63% said, I am concerned about systemic racism and racial injustice in this country. When we did it in June, 60% uh, said brands should publicly speak out against systemic racism and racial injustice. Again, you see a blip in the first part of August or middle of August, but before the shooting of Jacob Blake, um, and then you see an increase. But more than one in two expect brands to speak out even when their concerns were lower. Next slide, please. Again, widespread recognition of systemic racism increases after Jacob Blake is shot. 76%, a five-point increase. I personally believe that systemic racism and racial injustice exist in this country today. What is significant here is if you look at um, the increase for political affiliation, up 12 points among Republicans, and then for those who are 55 and older, up nine points. Again, um, disheartening, but this indicates that some people have to see this horror in order to believe that there actually is a problem. Next slide, please. 
there's been a lot of conversation about the protest. Um, are, there, are, there, are, are the protests peaceful? Do we believe in the protests? Are they actually making a difference? Support for protests jumps after Jacob Blake's shooting. So again, we went into the field uh, on August 21st, and then we went back. After the shooting, we saw 57% up nine points. I personally support the current nationwide protests and demonstrations against systemic racism and racial injustice. But look at, again, political affiliation, up 17 points with Republicans, up uh, significantly across the board. And again, with um, Black people and communities of color, this remains a significant concern, but it's across the board. Next slide, please. Now, this one is interesting because uh, we've been seeing a lot of different data on this. Uh, according to our data, 58% of the U.S. general population says, I support the mission and the actions of the Black Lives Matter movement. You look at it with age and gender, political affiliation, obviously higher with uh, Democrats uh, than it is with Republicans, um, almost significantly the same with men and women, um, higher with uh, younger people, 18 to 34, but significant across the board, and obviously most high with Black people with African Americans. Next slide, please. Now, it's a lot of action, it's a lot of conversation, there's a lot of escalation. Is anyone listening? Can anyone hear these calls for change? Uh, not according to uh, this study, only 36% of the US population believes that government is hearing or listening to these calls for action. Um, only 52% of the U.S. general population believes that business is actually hearing the call for action. This was in particular for the business that we do disturbing because we've seen a trend over the past several years that uh, trust in government to do anything uh, is low. There's trust in government to do the right thing. And there's also a sense that government is not competent enough to do the right thing. And so generally speaking, then it leaves it to business to pick up the mantle and to do more work. But here, only 52% believes that business is actually hearing all of this conversation and hearing these calls for change. Next slide, please. So business seen as failing to act on racism. When we did our original report in June, we said to the business community after we shared all of this data, there's four things that you have to do. One, you have influence, and so you have to educate and influence. You have to advocate. You have to create change. You have to get your own house in order, uh, something that all the organizations that we are advising and we at Edelman are doing ourselves. Get your own house in order. And the fourth thing we said to business is that if you don't, there are ramifications because people will now buy or boycott based on how they feel about things. But according to this most recent data, business is seen as failing to act on racism in these key three areas. Are you creating change? No. Are you educating and influencing? Not enough. Are you getting your own house in order? Depends on who you're talking to. But look at the data here for black people. So the gaps are significant, 27, 25, 21, 18, 28, even 30 with Asian Americans. But if you look at the performance gap for how do black people evaluate businesses' ability or businesses' willingness to act on racism, these gaps are significant. Um, do you believe that they'll create change? Negative 45. Educate and influence? No, you're not doing that. Negative 41. Are you getting your own house in order in the Black community? Negative 37. Next slide, please. So where is, there's got to be a, 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 a sparkly light somewhere, and it is with my employer. So not feeling good about NGOs, not feeling good about media, not feeling good about business. I actively believe the respondents, I actively distrust government on a response to racism, but I do have confidence in my employer. 71% say that they trust that their employer will do the right thing when it comes to responding to the problem of systemic racism and racial injustice in this country. Um, I heard on, on the earlier panel, we talked about what is the role of people at work uh, the role of people at work is to drive your employer to change. And apparently there is a trust, um, a strong bond between us and our individual employers, not in business. Uh, and you'll see later, not in CEOs, but my individual employer, I believe, um, can do the right thing. 
Next slide, please. Now, uh, where do I get my information from? Um, and who do I trust to get my information? Noteworthy, 25% of all of those polled U.S. populations say that I don't think there is a trustworthy information source. I don't trust anyone to give me information on this. Where I do have some trust, however, is with advocacy organizations, many of whom are on, on attending this conference and in this program, and activist organizations. So uh, that's where the weight and the responsibility is with almost all groups, but particularly um, with Black people. I trust advocacy organizations and I trust activist organizations to give me the right information. Next slide. Now, um, you saw where media fell on that list. It was not very high at all. It was not very impressive at all. Um, so there is, however, a battle between social media and mass media for increased attention. Um, and it depends on who you are. Uh, Black Americans, Latinx Americans, and Republicans are more likely to get their information from social media. On the other hand, uh, 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 white Americans, Democrats, and Asian Americans are more likely to get their information from mass media or to have confidence in where that media is coming from. We could probably spend two days on this, this slide alone. Next one, please. Media is seen as stereotyping people of color. I mean, this is not, um, this is not a surprise. Um, the role of the media uh, the role of the media to be responsible, to be balanced, to be fair, and to not bring their own agenda and their own issues into coverage is significant here. As a, as a, as a trained journalist, this one breaks my heart, but it doesn't surprise me at all. So 49% believe the news media, because of the stories it chooses to cover and not cover, makes it more likely that other racial groups will see Blacks and Hispanics, i.e. Latinos, in a negative light. Um, another piece of data we have on this one, it's not on this slide, 62% said that in covering the demonstrations against racial injustice, the news media had purposely focused more on rioting, rioting than on peaceful demonstrations. Again, not new to this crowd, uh, but very new and important for other audiences to see this data about the role of media and the irresponsibility of media, not all media, but media in general, according to this research. Next slide, please. So who do I trust? Who do I believe to will tell me the truth about racial injustice? Um, my friends and my family, 67%. I believe my friends and my family, um, that's who I talk to, that's who I believe um, in when I have conversations. If I'm trying to share information or get information, I have confidence, I trust the data that I'm getting from friends and family. And also, um, not too far behind that, social scientists and experts on race. Um, on the bottom of that list, and this is where our business comes in, and, and Richard will, will talk about this more, are company CEOs. So company CEOs at the bottom of the list. My CEO, again, significant with my employer in the middle, but lots of work to be done with the business community. Richard? Thank you, Lisa. So um, I want to now go on to um, explain the development of this issue. When we went into the field in June, we actually saw that it was brands expected to lead in this discussion. Now we find that uh, actually corporations are expected to have an equal um, kind of voice in um, this. Uh, and we see that uh, in the necessity, Alex, um, the necessity of being able to communicate um, as brand and corporation equally is urgent, um, that uh, in fact there's an equality of those two um, and an inextricable connection of those two. And we now need then to move um, into a place where, next slide please, um, both brands and corporations are addressing racism. And we see it primarily now as a matter of owing it to your employees. It is not a moral issue only, nor is it just that I want to sell more products, that brands and corporations, um, next slide please, um, that you see that brands have to stand with me at the very bottom of that list. In June, that was the highest. So in fact, we've now seen employees emerge as the primary motive um, for corporations. 
If I'm going to stay and work there, I want my company to speak up and be an actor. Next, please. Okay, so we've talked a bit about um, the idea of performative uh, kind of behavior. It's really bad uh, in terms of your trust levels. If you actually just talk and don't do, you are opportunistic and exploitive. And that's particularly true in the African-American community, also true in the Latinx. So like 70 and 60. Again, higher for Dems, higher for younger. That's a consistent theme. But do and communicate. Don't just talk. Next, please. Business is expected to act to create change. Remember Lisa's slide that showed trust levels of business in general 15 points higher than government. My employer, 30 points higher than government. Government at the bottom, business in the middle, my employer at the top. This is a big signpost, folks. It's an opportunity. We have to address the root causes. That means being involved in your local community. It means not just being involved in Shanghai or in Milan or you know internationally. That's good, but you have a home market. We have to make change there. We also have to inspire customers and employees to get involved, give them opportunities, give them the chance to volunteer with local NGOs. Make sure that the local NGOs actually are functional, that they have good boards, that they have the sufficient funding. And also partner with racially diverse organizations. Remember that low trust level for CEOs? The only way that CEOs are going to get ahead is to, in a certain way, borrow credibility from partnering with racially diverse organizations. Next, please. I also want to really emphasize the um, importance of education and advocacy. Next slide, please. Marketers have budget and they can make a difference in who they put up in ads. I need the next slide, please. Um, and also that we actually do have a problem. It's urgent that we educate the public in part by showing successful people who are not just actors, athletes, and other. We have to show just the successful family business person able to make it ahead in America of the black community, Hispanic community, et cetera, and advocate for racial equality through the reality of showing that success. Next slide, please. And business must get its own house in order. It starts from inside out. You've seen that my employer is the most trusted. Well, if that's the case, then my employer better do something. And that means at Edelman, for example, we are percent at right now 26% um, in our diverse population. Our objective is 30 for next year. Among senior management, we're at 14. Our objective for next year is 20. Those are numbers. That's how I manage. But I also manage through personal leadership. And that's what's expected in this time, in this place. A CEO, not just measuring, but advocating, pushing, and endorsing, and making sure that people of color feel good in the corporation. So zero tolerance for racist behavior. Ensure all organization levels have a good representation and remove all racist symbols Good for PepsiCo for removing Aunt Jemima symbol, and really great for Unilever for changing the song on the ice cream trucks. But also, let's push our clients and companies to have products that are specific to the needs of the communities, and that there are stores in those communities so that people can buy the products. Both. Next, please. I also want to urge companies to get the supply chain run by minority-owned small business into their purchasing. It's 5% of Edelman's purchases now. It's going to be 10% for next year. And that means CEOs like me have to be not just sort of 
saying things about racism, but be actively and proactively anti-racist. We have a responsibility to address racism at its core. It is leaders who now need to stand up and be counted. So as you can see, higher expectation among black Americans that this is going to happen. That's great. Next, please. We have a lot of work to do, folks. 60% of all respondents report that they see racism in their organizations. 75% of African Americans, 65% of Hispanics. This is not the America that I want to see, and I'm sure all of you feel the same. And so, again, lead from the front. Make sure that people feel comfortable reporting acts of racism. And they could be uh, just ignorance, and they could be active behavior. But whichever it is, we owe it to our people to make this a better workplace. Next, please. We have big work to be done on DNI and also on culture. The obvious sort of lack of employee diversity, this idea of a racist workplace culture, compensation, make sure that people are paid fairly. Uh, and that's, that's the minimum standard. Work to be done. Fix your internal house. Next, please. There's big consequences to having racism in the workplace. We measure four attributes in employee engagement, trust, advocacy, loyalty, and motivation. If you see one act of racism, it takes away a quarter of your trust. If you see two or three, it takes away another quarter. If you say three or more, it takes away half. Again, it's in every company's interest to run a racially colorblind, organization. That's where we have to get to an employee-employer relationship. Next, please. I want to talk about the brand side now. Brands do well when they address racial issues. Any thought that it's better to let this time pass is false. So, specifically, if I'm an African American, if I'm a white American, or any kind of American, by three to one, by three to one, we're better off in terms of gaining trust for that brand by sticking our head up and saying, this is the right way forward. We can do this together. It is our time as brands to use our marketing monies to stand up and do this. Meanwhile, for the corporations in terms of trust, in terms of corporate trust, and this is an important statistic, four to one gain in terms of corporate reputation. So on the brand side, three, on the corporate side, four. But among African-Americans, 10 to one, 10 to one gain in trust if a corporation stands up and speaks up. Four and a half to one for Latin X, et cetera. So again, any idea that a corporation is better to keep its head down and say nothing and do nothing is false. We have proven this in trust for brands and corporations. Next, please. Take a look at this. If you're a brand marketer, you have a 50% chance of getting a purchase intent if you stand up and speak up on systemic racism. And it's two thirds of African Americans who will consider your brand if you speak up. Again, big opportunity for business, big responsibility for business as well. We can do this. Next, please. Here's a shocker. In our data, we find that half the people are unaware of brands' actions to address racism. It's stunning. <laughs> it's an opportunity. It's our moment. This is a fallow field that we need to plant and we need to move. We need to get this done. Next, please. So let me try to give you a quick summary. Um, if you would just forward the slides to the end, and then I'll just read through all of the um, data points. Thank you. Yeah, just keep, keep um, scrolling, and I'll go through all of them. <clears throat> it's best this way. I don't love build slides. Oh, well. <laughs> um, look. 
Anti-racism is a long-term expectation for business. We are the trusted institution. All eyes are on us to do. People have written off government as a possibility. They don't trust the media. NGOs are the last mile, but they don't have the power. We have the power, we have the ability, and yet we're not quite doing it yet. It is our time. There is no excuse now in terms of trust, in terms of purchase intent, and in terms of employee loyalty. Every one of the signs show that we'll be better off acting, speaking up, and doing than being passive. Next point, the CEO, me and others. We have to partner to gain credibility. Do not let your CEO be the first, foremost, and only authority on this subject. You saw the list. They are bottom of 20 as to credible source. So let the CEO establish the vision and then let the chief diversity officer, head of human resources, or others lead the exercise. CEOs can come back once every quarter saying, here's our progress, I'm so proud, here's the changes I'm gonna make, but the spokesperson, the actor, has to be the other people. And CMOs as well. And I give huge kudos to companies like HP that have made this a credential for keeping the business. We have to have constantly improving scores on their business in order to be agency for HP. Bravo. Third, marketers have a tremendous role to play in changing the perceptions uh, in America. They have the marketing budgets, they have the ability to go beyond athletes, celebrities, others. There are real families making big success stories in America. We need to see those people. And marketers need to do more than the kind of Nike approach of, you know, just be it or whatever. That's fine, that's a good statement. Um, I, I, like, I like brands like uh, Dove. Dove Men's over Father's Day said hashtag no Father's Day and came out uh, very strongly in saying that we have excessive uh, jail terms and too many people um, who are black in jail because they don't get to celebrate Father's Day with their kids. That's the kind of advocacy that I want to see from marketers. Yeah, a little edgy, a little go for it. That's what's going to make the change. Lastly, this is first and foremost about black Americans. Make no mistake, all communities of color matter. And there are major major needs for Asian Americans and Hispanics. But this is the time for black Americans. And we need to recognize that the data says it's 20 points higher than for white, 10 points higher on average on every data point uh, than, than Asian and Hispanics in terms of expectations of business. So focus and let's get this done. So with that, Lisa and I are very proud uh, to have done this research. Um, we'll be back in the field um, before the end of the year with a third version of this. And, you know, it's our intent to push like hell. So with that, ladies and gents, we take any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Richard. I'm going to um, I'm going to introduce the panel that's going to have a conversation about this. Um, but I want to go back to something that Richard said uh, twice in here. One about colorblind and two about this being a black American. So I am I am black. I am um, I'm gratefully um, I'm, I'm proud. I feel like I got lucky by being black. And so in any workplace, see my blackness. Uh, if I'm Latinx, see my Latinx. If I'm white, see who I am. And so I I want to be really clear that the understanding of all of this work that we talked about being done cannot be done unless you see me for me. I had a um, colleague, a client actually say to me, and she thought it was a compliment. And she said, I just, I, I don't see you as black. I see you as a badass. And I was like, then you don't see me if you don't see me as black as that's part of who I am. So I wanna address that and um, let's continue with the conversation. Uh, when we, Edelman talked about how we would play in this space or continue to play in this space. We, like others, chose uh, some partners to, to work with. One of them, I'm really proud to say, as a former journalist, was the National Association of Black Journalists. And I'm really happy to welcome Dorothy Tucker, the president of NABJ, to moderate this conversation where we're going with perspectives from media and business, uh, which are two of the issues that we talked about. So uh, uh, joining us, Lee Hawkins. Wall Street Journal editor and author of the forthcoming book, Nobody's Slave. Uh, Mita Malik, head of multicultural marketing at Unilever. 
uh, Keita Highsmith, Chief Diversity Officer at Genentech, and my friend and colleague, uh, Trish Smith, who is uh, Edelman's very own Global Chief Diversity Officer. Uh, Dorothy, I'll turn it over to you. for partnering with us. This is something we're very excited about, something we're definitely looking forward to. And, you know, like you, Lisa, as a as a, a, a black woman who, who grew up at a time watching television and, you know, feeling like uh, I just wanted to be Shirley Temple because there were no other images out there. Uh, there was no one out there that looked like me. So this report to me is is critical, and I'm very impressed with what you guys are doing. And believe me, after reading this, even more excited about the partnerships uh, with NABJ. We only have about 10 to 15 minutes left uh, on the clock, I understand, so I'm going to get right to it. Uh, the numbers that you and, and Rich talked about are, are just, again, amazing. Lee, I'm going to start with you uh, because, you know, let's repeat. 54% of Americans say that there has not been sufficient focus in the news media on the underlying issues that sparked the current protest against racial injustice. 62% say that in covering the demonstrations against racial injustice, the news media has focused on looting and rioting at the expense of peaceful protest. Are you surprised at the findings and do how much of a role should the media play in ending systemic racism as opposed to fueling it? Yes, I am surprised by the findings, first of all, because I didn't think the public was that conscientious enough to want to see more coverage of uh, race and racism in the media. I think that the media does is even less diverse than the general population. Uh, and what that does is it puts us at a real disadvantage because African Americans and people of color are closer to these issues and therefore could be teachers and also individuals who should be listened to in newsrooms to help guide the coverage. That's a burden that many of us feel. And But, but right now it, it, it's on our shoulders, unfortunately, because of the fact that so few of our colleagues are knowledgeable about these issues. And that's just a reflection, I believe, of the broader American educational system and also the reluctance of people to want to come face to face with the hard truths of this country. When you don't know the history, then you don't know that for from 1619 to 1964, white supremacy was the law in America. And it's been all but 56 years that we have that African Americans have been considered equal uh, to black, to white people on paper. So that means only 56 years of equality on paper. What does that tell people? That means that people in this country have been groomed to believe that African Americans asking for equality is actually oppressive of white people, oppressing white people, when that's not the case. But when you've been socialized to believe this, and there hasn't been any serious history being taught. Uh, to the contrary, that's what we believe. And a lot of these people are in our newsroom. It doesn't mean that it's are in our newsrooms. It doesn't mean that uh, they are racist, intentionally racist or, or showing racial animus. But the truth is, is they just don't know or don't want to accept the realities of this country. And that's where we have to start in the media. We have to have a media that's more reflective of the general population and that's showing that's that's respectful and acknowledging the swift demographic change that is occurring and the incredibly profound influential role that people of color play in this country. If you want to be relevant with the media, that's the first place to start, is to understand that we cannot do our jobs if we do not understand these issues. If you, It's not because we're trying to do the right thing. It should be because we're trying to do our jobs and we want to make sure that we're the best journalists that we can possibly be. Well, I'll tell you, the, uh, the kind of research that Edelman has done about um, the, the marketing industry is definitely something that we need to see and we will be doing at NABJ because uh, you're absolutely right when you
rather do not look look like us. Let me move on to the question of business. And Trish, this one is for for you. 76% of Americans, as we saw, personally believe that systemic racism and racial injustice exists in this country. Uh, startling numbers of 5% since Jacob Blake's shooting in the protest in Kenosha. The greatest increases are for Republicans, 12% up and 50 in those 55 and over. Trish, why do you think that the recent events in Kenosha stemming from the shooting of Jacob Blake have increased the recognition of racism, in particular among older conservative Americans? So um, while I'm not older or conservative, I believe that there are several reasons or issues that contribute to the rise. First and foremost, I think it's because of the the proliferation of information, right? We have access to and an increase in information. We can see things playing out on our social feeds almost real time. And then that social media information is feeding over and moving over to traditional or mass media. So it's the access of information. Those who may have been blind or chose to ignore the realities of our society and the ongoing systemic racism now cannot ignore it because it's up close and personal. I also think that we're also seeing this rise because of a host of other factors. We have COVID, we have the divisive political environment. We have these continued acts of systemic racism and the atrocities that have been going on for hundreds of years playing out all at the same time. And many voices are now recognizing that they cannot be quiet. And so we're seeing this surge uh, in uh, the acknowledgement of and the call for change. And then finally, I do believe, and as my prayer that we have, we have experienced and are experiencing sort of a moral awakening in which we know that we can no longer be silent, that all of us have to stand up and say something. Okay. Media, so let, let's uh, let's piggyback off of what Trisha is saying and, and look at the businesses. How can what can businesses do to fill the void? Uh, how can businesses be a source, uh, create a source of credible information? Uh, you know, so that people will believe, uh, well, will have a better understanding rather of what they see uh, in the media. Yeah, thanks for that question and having me today. Fantastic research by Edelman. And I would say what we're doing at Unilever is building an end-to-end diversity, equity, and inclusion system, which is so important. So all the four pillars that the research talked about, first, really looking at workforce and getting your house in order. Uh, You know, what gets measured gets done at the end of the day. And we know that as marketers. So why is it any different when we think about workforce? So it starts with diverse slates, but also thinking about succession planning, thinking about how you're supporting Black employees, and also thinking about how you're setting your organization up to be anti-racist with programs, policies, and culture. The second, as we talked about, how do your brand show up in the marketplace, uh, brands and products and services, and really thinking about um, how you're measuring those. What influencers are you working with in a meaningful way? Um, and also thinking about how you're trying to grow loyalty with different communities. That's so important. Uh, Third is supplier diversity, which we're very focused on at Unilever. And I think when we talk about supplier diversity, we often say, let's measure minority-owned businesses. Let's get even more granular and say, how are you supporting Black owned businesses and measure that. I think the final pillar is around social justice, which we talked about, and how do you actually uh, show that you're building meaningful relationships in the communities you serve. And the work we did with Edelman and Good Humor is a fantastic example of this, because you can say you stand for values, but are you standing up for them? And so when we discovered that Turkey and the Straw was a racist, strong, racist song that was tied to minstrel shows. Uh, we, we knew it was our moment to step in and step up and actually get that song, song changed with RZA and Wu-Tang. So those are just some of the things that we're doing at Unilever that all organizations should be looking at. Uh, one of the things that struck me is that um, the respondents said that it is happening in the workplace, that people notice that there is systemic racism uh, in their workplace and they want to see that addressed. So, Keita, my question for you, what can companies do to address systemic racism in the workplace for those who are producing every day? All right. Well, thank you so much for the question. I think that is an important one. First off, to build trust, you have to budget what you value, right? If b is important to the company, they will find a way to fund it, staff, train, metrics, spend, because that's when people take you seriously when you put your money where your mouth is. 
The second one is a leadership commitment, right? The most senior person in the organization, the chief executive officer, has to buy in, has to understand what these issues are. And a person like me, the chief diversity officer, it's important where that all sits, right? Is it sitting with the CEO? So you're at the at the most senior table, or are you off in the corner in HR or in some other area? You know, the other thing that I think that we have to think about is people right now want to be an ally, but what really is an ally, right? It's somebody who says, you know what, I agree with you. But really what we're looking for is people who can go across the spectrum, right? To be an advocate, somebody who's prepared to use their position to challenge, right? Or to be an activist, ready to confront leaders to take some risk. Or ultimately, the ultimate ally is the change maker, right? They're the ones who are actively fighting for change in the system and the structure. So hashtag change makers is what we really need. And I think we have to be honest with ourselves. Diversity and inclusion is multifaceted. It is complex. And there is a whole host of systemic issues and there is no magic solve, right? This is grinding hard work, commitment, still resolve, and we have to be transparent because that's what we people are looking for, especially people of color. We're looking for some transparency, some recognition that we know things are not working and that we're going to be intentional and bold in our efforts to make change. We've only got about three minutes left. So, Lee, uh, starting with you, I'm going to end with you. Um, so let's talk about just, again, the solution, what the hope is. What are you hoping to see, especially, you know, marketers, businesses in this space? What are you hoping we begin to see uh, in marketing to America so that perhaps we can, you know, bring about a better understanding of all races? I think it's important for companies to see how swiftly demographics are changing in this country and how important people of color are as consumers uh, of their of their goods and products and and how that helps them. It's not just about altruism. It's about capitalism. If you're not going to just appeal to people of color because it's the right thing to do, then appeal to them because your bottom line depends on it. It's important for companies to um, to look, to be honest about what they are doing and what they are not doing. Right now, we have three or four CEOs that are African-American in the Fortune 500. Uh, in 2012, that was our max. We were at six. So it's great to be making all of these commitments to, to make statements on social media and everything. But what about in the upper echelons of corporate America? Are you willing to have a black man or a black woman in the, in the meetings every day with the CEO and potentially being on track to become the CEO? When you look at your board of directors, how many, what committees are the people who are of color what committees are they sitting on? Are they sitting on committees that affect the day-to-day -day operations of the company, or are they just symbolic committees that really don't have any impact on the outcome of it and the profit of the company? And so that's the question. How willing are, pe how willing are people to actually have people of color in positions of prominence and paying them equally? How, how offended are you if an African-American is doing outstanding work and that person continues to thrive, but they are making more than you? Is it, do you? Does it have to be from the standpoint of you as a patronizing individual, as a CEO bringing in an African-American, or is it as an individual who's willing to invest and understand that this individual may replace me at some point and this person is worthy of leading this organization and so i'd like to see more in the upper echelons and if we want to think about racism we have to understand the way that economics intertwine with that and the way that um people are uh, have been compensated on unfairly for decades and it's very important to understand that companies can i easily identify the things that they can do that are substantive hard benchmarks, empirical benchmarks, as opposed to just symbolic platitudes and speaking kindly about Africa. We, great, we love that, that people are, are conscious right now, but the key is you have to first admit what you do not know, and what you do not know is hurting the organization and understanding that now history and, and 
understanding history and reading and getting educated is your obligation if you do not understand these issues and you will no longer seek to be relevant. You will no longer be relevant as a leader if you do not understand these issues. And I think that's where we are right now in America. I, I hope that this, uh, I hope we see some lasting change. And this is just not something that happens. It's a fad for today. Lita, Kenta, no, I'm sorry, Kenta. Uh, Kata, Mita, Lee, Trish, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Rich and uh, Lisa, I will throw it back to you guys.